Welcome back to Bracewell's Environmental Essentials webinar series. I'm Kevin Ewing. The first Tuesday of every month, as you know, we focus on a particular issue that's probably bubbling on the periphery of your attention. Our goal is to catch you up efficiently with enough information or insight so that you can decide whether it's something that merits your sustained attention right now or something you can lay some groundwork for and, and await further developments. Triage, basically. So today we're looking at ESG, uh, Environmental Sustainability and Governance Reporting. Obviously, lots is happening on ESG. Enough is happening, in fact, that we thought it would be worthwhile to give you a high-level view of the situation rather than focus on the details. This role works a lot on ESG issues, uh, and I have for many, many years, uh, for public companies principally. And we've also defended companies when challenged in investigations on their disclosures and when facing shareholder proxy proposals and, and similar demands. So we've seen the upside and we've seen the downside to ESG. And that's why we think the most important point really is that ESG requires a strategic perspective, not a tactical one. Um, by tactical, what I mean is like that scene in uh, when Harry met Sally, you know, oh, I'll have what she's having. Uh, that proved illusory in the movie, and it doesn't too work too well in industry either. Just because some other company is doing it and apparently likes it doesn't mean it'll feel the same for you. So a strategic perspective, in contrast, recognizes that you need to have a long-term view of how ESG reporting will likely unfold over the years for your company. And it recognizes attendant legal risks, and it also makes ESG subject to traditional corporate governance ideas and structures, rather than just being an incidental activity that's developed in a silo off on the side by some enthusiastic ESG evangelists that you might hire. So, what are some of the key trends? There are a lot of trends, but we're trying to distill this down. Clearly, we're seeing lots more shareholder demands for disclosure and for specific kinds of commitments in the context of ESG reporting. Uh, we're seeing more companies prepare inaugural reports, their first ESG reports and contending with subsequent reports, which can prove problematic. Uh, we're seeing a lot of competition among disclosure formats. Lots of different groups are touting their particular model, creating some noise in the marketplace. Two other contextual factors also, the SEC's stance on ESG reporting under the 33 and 34 acts, it's crucial. Uh, currently, SEC staff uh, are not pushing the issue as much as they had been for a number of years, but that could change on a dime in January, depending on the election results. So let's do some numbers just to get an orientation. You can see there's lots of money that's tagging up on ESG reporting. But what does that really mean? Institutional investors use different approaches. I've listed seven of them here in order of frequency. Now this is 2018 data, but I think it's, it's nevertheless quite useful. Note that some investors use multiple different approaches when looking at companies' ESG reports. We should all keep an eye on how the order of these different approaches changes. You know, they're in order of frequency now, but how will that change over time? So, for example, is exclusionary screening going to give way to more nuanced or flexible approaches rather than a binary you're in or you're out? An increase in reliable ESG information across the board over time should encourage less binary approaches and more evaluative approaches. So I consider looking at these different screening modes and tracking how much money really flows under each of them to be quite important and is a useful barometer uh, for future developments. So striving ESG activists. Uh, everyone has their own take on this. Mine reflects what I've been seeing um, over the last 20 plus years uh, in the marketplace, but also dealing directly with ESG activists. You'll see that some of these motivations overlap and some are quite distinctive and different. Uh, the point is that these motivations aim at different ideas of success, um, ranging from forcing oil and gas out of business entirely <laughs> on the one hand, to pushing oil and gas to balance or hedge carbon risk or perceived climate risk in ways in order to preserve the business so that it does not go out of business. Two very different conceptualizations. 
of success. And what this in turn means is with different motivations driving uh, ESG activism, there is no one ESG formula that's going to satisfy all the different motivations of activists. So setting that as a goal is not going to be successful. Now, let's look for a second to the bottom of the slide. What motivates companies? In our experience, um, fewer things uh, motivate companies. Companies seek to protect uh, their market valuation by towing the line on carbon and climate issues sufficiently to not stick out of the herd. And second, they want to protect their social reputation. In particular, uh, note that that third item, which I put in you know, parentheses, risk management, is overwhelmingly not a key motivation of companies when they're looking at doing ESG reporting, or they're refining and expanding the existing ESG reporting. That in itself is pretty important. Um, companies generally do not use their own ESG analyses to help them manage risks to their business operations or their financial prospects. It's just this side thing that they're doing and talking about. This is important because it sets up a real uh, dichotomy, a difference uh, out of which risk can grow. ESG activists uh, generally work from the premise that ESG reporting and supportive analysis is essential to risk management and must be considered, and in fact considered uh, preeminently among other factors in corporate decision making. And companies simply tend not to believe that and not to do that. It's this delta that leads to a misalignment of expectations when doing, for example, two degree scenario analysis about which you've probably been hearing. Yeah, you know, companies do them in order to disclose th that you've done them in an ESG report, but most companies are not actually thinking about using the results of that scenario analysis as the planning basis for their corporate decisions, operations, and capital deployment. So, ESG trends do not exist in isolation, uh, at least not anymore. ESG trends tend to flow with the current of our times, and they draw strength from prevailing social trends right now. And we have a lot of social trends right now that are very strong, very strong currents. Um, the upshot is that, you know, from a corporate standpoint, you can't really address ESG trends without an awareness of how they tie into broader social trends or societal trends that are contributing energy and direction to them. Part of the ESG trend line is, of course, the proliferation of so-called standards that are ostensibly designed to drive convergence toward uh, similar disclosure rubrics among companies in a given sector or even across sectors. Right now, I'd say that TCFD and the SASB probably have the best chance of actually becoming points of significant convergence globally and also in North America. With SASB, uh, please note the introduction of two features that I've, that I've listed there. The materiality map is worth looking at. It identifies the material issues that they believe exists for every sector, business sector. Essentially, for each type of business, they have assigned a list of issues that they deem material if you're in that business line. Very normative uh, judgment. And everything's based on that. Everything they do in, in setting their standards is based on that uh, original materiality map. It's worth looking at and keeping abreast of for your particular sector. Um, the second feature is something relatively new for SASB, and that's what they call the navigator. The navigator is um, is basically a service. I think you can buy it for about $1,000 a year, give or take. And what it does is it gives anyone who pays the entrance fee, it gives them a company-specific report based on that company's ESG disclosures, as well as a comparison of that company's position on ESG uh, as compared to peers in that identified industry sector. Anyone can buy this um, or have access to it for any company, provided they pay the $1,000 subscription fee generally on an annual basis. So this feature provides an inexpensive way for investors to judge you. And um, the judgment is entirely the opinion of SASB. Indeed, judging business is booming in ESG. 
Um, just as SASB is getting into the informal ratings business and comparison business, others are are in it for for real uh, and focus very directly on it. Sustainalytics is one, MSCI is one, of course, Bloomberg, ESG is another, and there are others. And of course, the stock exchanges are involved as well, trying to create some value or perceived value out of the uh, sort of the trend line. Um, and the trend on ESG judging uh, aligns with a fundamental principle of, of mine, at least, about the marketplace, and that is the market is unbelievably lazy. Um, the market uh, prefers not to actually figure out the answer to a question on the merits. The market prefers um, very consistently to rely on whatever else is available that purports to answer the question and doesn't cost too much to obtain. That's always going to be preferred as a source of decision making in the marketplace, uh, by and large, than actually scrubbing and doing your own work to analyze a company. And so, what these judging ESG judging organizations are counting on is, in fact, that laziness, that market laziness. They're providing a very cheap, sometimes free or inexpensive report that purports to answer the question: How is a company doing on ESG, and how does that compare to peers? What that is founded on um, is, is often, you know. Uh, scotch tape and bailing wire, a lot of opinion, but it tends to drive uh, opinion in the marketplace. So when we see all that happening as kind of the overall trend line, um, what what's the job of the executive? And what's the role of the lawyer helping the executive? Uh, from our experience, helping in-house counsel and helping executives at, at public companies, I would say two things really leap out um, as central observations. Uh, the first one is that, you know, corporate leadership routinely, and I would say fairly significantly, underestimates the challenge of preparing and managing ESG reports. You know, what begins with, hey, you know, let's do this, uh, seems like a good thing to do and how hard can it be? Uh, that turns into this is sucking a lot of time and expertise is a significant distraction and is raising a lot of complex issues and questions that I don't feel prepared for. And that migration from, hey, let's do this to, holy cow, I'm not ready for this, is an uncomfortable transition. And it's usually a transition that happens after some commitments have been made to the marketplace that you're going to be engaging either newly or more extensively in ESG reporting. And that's a pretty uncomfortable place to be when you're the in-house lawyer than trying to catch that executive up to what's entailed. So the best way I can put this is that it's important to try to express, I think, to executives in whatever way you can, um, you're not buying peace or peace of mind um, from shareholders or others when you issue an ESG report. It's much more like you're making a down payment on a house that you're gonna be living in for a long time. And by the way, that down payment is a small down payment. That ESG report's actually a small down payment. And the mortgage you've got on that house that you just bought is pretty big, you know, 10, 12% interest, uh, which some folks can't even imagine on this line, but the older folks here with me can remember those days. Uh, so the point is that this is an investment and you're gonna to have to pay a lot to maintain that investment over time. Does that mean you shouldn't make the investment as a company? No, but it does mean you need to have an understanding that it's actually a long haul and that it is a house to begin with that you want to be living in. This is where you want to be heading strategically for the company. So the second observation I would say um, is that ESG reporting carries risks. This is actually a surprise to many executives who really only thought of it as a as as having upside. You know, if they just spend the effort to do this ESG thing, it, it'll get them pennies. You know, better, better grading by you know those who judge, uh, more positive notoriety, uh, and so forth. But it actually does carry risks, and uh, and that point is sometimes overlooked or or even disputed by what I would say might, might be called the ESG evangelists out there, um, because they say, who could be against the environment? Who's against sustainability or governance? Well, of course, no one's against those things, but that's not where the risk lies. 
The risk, um, as we've seen in investigations, in lawsuits um, uh, over many years and participating directly in them, uh, is that the risk lies in creating a marketplace expectation or purportedly creating a marketplace expectation that the company uh, will modify its corporate strategy and its investments, uh, giving preponderant weight or disproportionate weight to ESG factors. And that's an expectation that arises quite naturally among ESG folks and also ever more participants in the marketplace, even notwithstanding that the company states in its report that these scenario analyses, for example, that are represented in the ESG report do not necessarily represent the company's view of the likeliest future against which it does its planning. That kind of a disclaimer has not yet been sufficient to dispel the marketplace expectation and to dissuade attorneys general, uh, state attorneys general from investigations. And that's a pretty uncomfortable place to be. It's this gulf between corporate reality and market expectation that drives risk in the ESG world. Um, so what do you do with that? You take a governance approach. That's the best approach that I have seen work. And it's the absence of a governance approach that I have seen cause lots of problems. Um, my colleagues and I have seen cause lots of problems uh, with companies. So ESG needs to fit within a governance structure. Um, the reality is that only that will ensure that there's a strategic framework that applies. Um, and, you know, without a strategic framework, you're apt to function in, on a siloed basis in preparing uh, ESG reports and on a basis that does not foster communication and um, disciplined implementation across operations, commercial, you know, legal, investor relations, and senior management. And those five areas really all need to be involved and comfortable with every step taken on the ESG platform. If ESG is built off on its own, it tends to create commitments that uh, do not fit the rest of the company, giving rise to overcommitments, public overcommitments, and a lot of internal tension trying to either walk back or work sideways from those commitments. So these questions that I've listed here are among those that are useful to think about when considering ESG reports. They're distilled from many conversations with clients over many years um, and are designed to sort of elicit the um, answers that in themselves demonstrate, oh, we have other things, other questions that flow from the answer I just gave you. You would not be surprised, uh, you, you, you would be surprised, excuse me, at how different the answers to these questions are depending on which executive in which function you're asking, commercial, operations, corporate development, legal, investor relations. Same questions get different answers. And once that becomes clear to people, they realize, oh, we actually need some alignment and we need a governance structure in order to uh, obtain that alignment. These are you know, some other questions um, that I think ultimately uh, are helpful to think about. Um, and I, you know, I'll, I'll let you just look at them here for a moment uh, as we think about it. A few here that are worth highlighting who else will use and abuse the report. Um, use is usually the focus. Oh, the Stanalytics, they'll be looking at it and grading us better because they can see it. Well, what about the abuse side? How can this be misunderstood? How can this be misused to try to drive the company toward commitments or toward achieving goals that it had not actually intended to set for itself? When you take that lens, you end up actually rewriting a lot of an ESG report because you realize, oh, wait a minute, um, this has the two edges to the sword. Um, a, a couple of others here. Um, what are the standards and assumptions and inputs that you're using? And are those inputs and assumptions going to be challenged either because your peers are using different assumptions or because they're different assumptions that the marketplace wants you to use? If you do want to use different assumptions, how do you talk about the fact that you've chosen to use different assumptions 
and why? These are very important questions that end up um, really strengthening uh, a company's approach to ESG. Here are a few other questions that have sort of bubbled up over the years of, of talking with, with a lot of companies about this and working with them on it. And I, I might draw your attention in particular to the penultimate one. How are you going to address negative trends? <clears throat> uh, we found that, you know, increasing the amount of disclosure in the ESG context feels terrific when all your bad numbers are getting better, right? Emissions are down, emissions intensity are going down, workplace safety, you know, numbers uh, or incident numbers are going down, you know. All of that feels good. Now, what happens when those numbers go in the wrong direction? Um, do you stop reporting them? Well, that doesn't work very well. Uh, but what do you do with that? And you have to anticipate that at the outset when, for example, deciding how detailed are you going to be in showing even the positive trends? Are you going to take it out one digit if it's numerical or two digits? You know, how sensitive is your reporting or disclosure going to be? Because the, that sensitivity works fine. That degree of granularity might work fine and be comfortable so long as you have a positive trend line. But as soon as it turns negative, that sensitivity will quickly indicate that you're heading in a different direction now suddenly as a company. And is that significant? Is that not significant? Um, can it be explained? So figuring out your ESG framework also includes figuring out how you want to deal with negative trend lines and what degree of disclosure, both in terms of scope and in terms of granularity, you really want to use. So, a couple of conclusions here, more or less in a nutshell. Um, there are lots of trends, but what I'd say is, you know, the existing trend lines show that ESG is is certainly quite important and just becoming more important. Uh, but it's also hard to do well, and it's easy to stumble unintentionally. Um, it raises significant strategic questions that are generally not anticipated at the outset, but ineluctably draw you into them uh, for decision making in subsequent years or even as you're preparing your first report. And those questions and the reporting that you do on the basis of those questions uh, invite marketplace expectations, sometimes well beyond what you intended and sometimes beyond even your express statement against creating those expectations. And those marketplace expectations can quickly outstrip the company's preparedness to satisfy them. The delta between expectation and performance is the business risk, is the legal risk. And the best way to protect the company against that is by nestling ESG within a very solid governance framework. It's by doing that that you can help ensure alignment, a common set of expectations within the company, uh, alignment and, and discipline in execution, uh, sufficient communication that you bump up against the strategic questions that lurk before you make commitments. Um, so governance is really the way, um, I think, to address a lot of these questions and ensure a strategic outlook. So our hope has been that this quick uh, view for you um, is helpful. There's lots of detail and we're happy to talk about the details, but in the end, we thought it might be more helpful for you to hear a perspective from folks who've sort of been doing this for a long time and have seen a lot of the stumbles and the tensions and the difficulties that have arisen and how one can head them off at the pass or address them once they uh, crop up. So I know in these pandemic times, we're not able to uh, be with one another uh, live, uh, but what we're doing is uh, setting up an email. My contact information is available or Dorn Pollard's uh, contact information is available for you to ask questions. Uh, we welcome them. We're happy to respond to them. It may take me a little bit of time uh, to do so, but we will we will get to those questions um, by email for you. And of course, you know how to reach us at Bracewell. We're always happy to talk with you. Thanks so much.